Before before we start, you you want to tell us about uh, Black Lives Matter? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Soros funds Black Lives Matter. For sure. Yeah. And it's across the whole country, but somehow or other there's, I, I don't know how they choose leaders, but um, there's this woman, I can't remember her name, Yeah. but she's a young black woman in the California <coughs> area, I believe, and she was being interviewed on uh, NPR, Brian Lair's show in the morning a few months ago. And um, so they're, you know, typical interview, asking all kinds of questions. So then Brian Lair says, he starts talking about the black church. And he wanted to, her to talk about her experience in the black church. And she said, well, I can't relate to that because I'm Jewish. And she was black. Yeah. Nice. The leader of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, but I, w I wouldn't be surprised even uh, uh, to find out that... Uh, Black Lives Matters uh, really run by people who are not black mm. at all. And uh, the reason is that, um, uh, you know, when uh, it took me by a complete shock to um, find out that. Uh, Martin Luther King, speechwriter, was a, car, a guy called Levinson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was really shocked by it, Martin but it made a. Were written yeah. So because because I, I I always thought I have a dream I have a dream no it, hey you tell them that you have a dream oh, it, <laughs> it made me that it, it, it's just a dream it, uh, you know it make a lot of sense. Hey <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah you dream now now. <coughs> something happened with Black Lives Matters. The out of the blue supported the Palestinian people. Now yeah. this is beautiful, huh? But slightly unusual. Because they have some problems here that they have to deal before they go to save the Palestinians. Is and it became a very big scandal. And I was sure when I read it that it's not the black people in Michigan or in, uh, or in uh, New York they said, oh, before we do everything, anything, we must support the... Uh, hey, but you have to go to the Palestine. No, it doesn't work this way. So, obviously, they were some very influential, influential JBPs or people who are related to kind of a Jewish progressives close to the top. It's, it's obvious. Well, but what's very scary for the you know, Jewish community who's trying to keep everybody silent is the fact that different groups are supporting each other and working with each other. And the same thing has happened in Standing Rock in the Dakotas. For sure. Where Palestinians went there with their flags flying you can see videos with Palestinian flags flying and standing rock. Let me make it very simple for you. For many years, I'm arguing that we are all Palestinians. Mm. Yeah. I've been in Detroit. It is sad. It looks worse, some quarters of it, worse than Gaza. It is frightening. All right? It is totally devastated. We are all Palestinians. Because we are all oppressed by a one single element. Including the Israelis, by the way. <coughs> including the Israelis. When the Israelis went to, 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 to live in tents in the streets, it was a kind of a huge uh, social, um, you know, a social move, a kind of a, 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 a uprise, huge movement. It is because the gap between rich and poor, between the Mammonites and the people in Israel, is huge. It's the biggest in the in the Western society. 
What the Israelis did, they started a fake war in Gaza. So when they use a fake war, they become, again, they forgot that they are Palestinians, they became Israelis. But we are all Palestinians. And once we understand that, the Jews have a very big reason to be fearful. Well, I have told people, I used to be involved with Palestine and New York, and the problem is, is that the Jews come in, they join every group, they invade every group, For sure. they take over and they destroy the groups. For sure. And uh, I have seen it happen, it's really despicable. And I have told people for years to watch and pay attention to what the Jews do to the Palestinians, because they're going to do it to you. And m many, most people do not know that for at least 10 or more years, our police forces across this country have been sent to Israel for assassination training. I, I did not, I know that they are sent, sent for uh, training. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I don't speak about things that I don't know. I can send you news articles about it. You can, you can go, you know, Google it. You'll find it. Yeah. There, there are people who have spoken out against it, but most people don't know about it. No, no, I, I don't have... I, I know that they are sent, they're sent to, uh, to, to, to training and drones and... I, I, know, I, know, I know all about it. Israel import, is, Israel export, uh, military export yeah. is... is, uh, is is huge and police ex policing export tactics and so on. I, I totally agree with you and I read, gave in six months ago, a year ago, talk about the method that Jewish activists use to destroy every dissent group and to turn it into a control opposition. It is very easy to explain. I'll do it very quick and you will be familiar with it. When there is a Jewish problem, the, Jewish, the Jews accept that there is a problem. This could be Palestine, banking, media domination, what else? Uh, decadence, uh, yeah? Pornography, whatever. Sex yeah? What the, Jews, what the Jews do, and it's not conspiratorial because most of it is kind of genuine, they start dissent. Alright, this is the dissent. If this is Palestine, yeah, this is JBP, let's say. If this is banking, this is Karl Marx, uh, Marxism, communism, blah, blah, blah. If this is media, this is democracy now. If this is uh, decadence, there will be, what is, what is the name of this Rachmilovich, Rachmanovich, uh, the Podesta, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. For sure, for sure, for sure. What happened then? No, let me, I'm doing it very quick now, yeah? What happened then? They start to fight each other. And when they fight each other, all the good Americans run away and sit here on the margin of the discourse and they say, let's let the Jews sort it out. They are in control of it. Now, I want to go back to your issue because we start to talk about it. White supremacy. Have you ever met a person who identify as a white supremacist? You say, well, hello, uh, what's your name? Uh, I'm, I'm Nita, I'm a white supremacist. I never met anyone who identify as a white supremacist. Now it's quite shocking because, hey, there are white supremacists. No, no. Where, where are they? Is, is he a white supremacist? Are, are you a white supremacist? Uh, no. What, what? What? No. Have you ever seen a person who identify as a Holocaust denier? I know one, and he's a Jew. <laughs> but people don't identify as Holocaust deniers. As a Holocaust denier, or Not as Holocaust deniers. <laughs> no, no. Holocaust deniers. No, no. They see themselves as Holocaust revisionists. Oh, okay. That's All right? Okay. All right? The most radical Holocaust revisionists, or history revisionists, they don't deny the Holocaust. They don't deny the fact that Hitler didn't like Jews. They don't de deny the fact that Hitler wanted the Jews 
to leave Germany or Juden frei want this country? They don't deny it. They cannot deny it. They're proper historians. Then deny some aspects of the story. Some of them believe that there were not gas chambers. Some of them uh, believe that the numbers are fabricated and so on and so on. One of the most common Judaic, and it is Judaic, tactics is to attach a label to a person or to a group of people. This is what it is. There are no white supremacists. It is something that Jewish politicians in this country invented in order to push identity politics. No, you can tell them. Tell them. Show me one white supremacist. Now, what is amazing for me <coughs> is that when I look at the alt-right, some elements within the alt-right, I'm quite embarrassed, I must admit. Because they start to sound like, uh, like rabbis. <laughs> and this is not very surprising. The alt-right, the Breitbart are control opposition. Yeah, obviously, I work a lot on cultural Marxism. And I'm about to publish a book about it. And then I found Andrew Breitbart. I thought, My fucking God. He's a clever guy. And we agree on everything. What a beautiful guy! But I was missing something. I'll make it short. I'll make it very short for you. I noticed that Andrew Breitbart, every talk he gave, or in every kind of paper he published, he managed to men mention his bar mitzvah and the impact of his bar mitzvah. Now, to have a bar mitzvah is not a problem. Here it comes. I always felt that there was something missing. He was writing and speaking. He wrote a great book about cultural Marxism just before he died. He published it just before he died. And in this book, he speaks about the Frankfurt School, about Adorno, Marcuse, uh, Orkheimer, touching Wilhelm Reich. These were all Jewish Marxists who came to America in the late 30s. They were Jews. They were running away from Germany. This is how Andrew Breitbart describes them. These because the Germans were getting fed up with cultural Marxism? For sure. Okay. No, no, but they, they, they were tired of cultural Marxism, definitely. But they also had to run away because they were Jews. And, and the Germans... Were progenitors of what the Germans were tired For sure, yeah. for sure. So, but uh, this is this is a, it is a valid point. But uh, I'm trying to push another point. No, no, it, you're right. You're right. They were all Jews, Marxist Jews. Andrew Breitbart says these Germans came to our country to interfere with our Judeo-Christian values. The trick. It took me one month to understand how to, 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 to put it together. What he did is very simple. He turns the Jews into Germans, i.e. enemies at the time of a war, and he turned the Americans into Jews. 
Should they have said, clever? Clever. Nobody got, he, he got away with it. So the biggest enemy of cultural Marxism, these people who create this, all this mess, is controlled opposition, dissent discourse. There is a battle and the fight now on cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School and this political correctness and identity politics is a battle between Soros and the Jews who support it and few Jews within the alt-right movement. Okay, now I'm getting confused because the very people who are screaming white supremacy are the very ones who follow cultural Marxism. Sorry? Yes. Say, say, it again, say it again, say it again. The very people who are screaming white supremacy are the very ones who follow cultural Marxism. For sure. Yeah. For sure. No, no, for sure, for sure. But th this, is, this is not a contradiction. Uh, these people here... And they're not Jews. They did, I'm talking about non-Jews. No, no, for sure. For sure, for sure. But what I'm, I'm, I'm going back to Sleskin. Okay. With this method, with this method, Okay. We learn to divide society and each of us thinking like a Jew. So, if the Jew was defined by the anti-Semite, the black identitarian, the black as a black, is defined by the white supremacist. The feminist is defined by the white male chauvinist. Who else? The Muslim is defined by the white Islamophobe. And suddenly, the Jews, who had so many enemies, they have so many friends. Because they were with the black against the white supremacists. They are with the Muslim against the Islamophobe. ADL will be against, uh, with the Muslims against the Islamophobe. They are with the men, women against the <coughs> we, male chauvinist, white male chauvinist. But even white people are screaming white For sure, for sure. But a lot of white people, half of them, half of America, half of the voters okay. bought into it. Yeah? Many of them are white. But the question is whether they will have anything to hold on to within three months or four months. And this is something that we will know after, after 100 days of Trump in office. Because, as I said, there are no Holocaust deniers. There are no white supremacists. They are hyperventilated <laughs> by what we call an empty signifier. It's a genius idea. You create, create a box, a tag, that doesn't mean a thing, and you can throw into it whatever you like. There are no people who identify themselves as white supremacists. So when, Je when America joined the war and uh, found, found itself in a war in Europe, there were a lot of German soldiers, or even the Waffen-SS or the SS, they identified with the National Socialist ideology. But how can we fight the white supremacists if there are no people? who call themselves white supremacists. What kind of a war? It's like, uh, it's like the Don Quixotes. It's like the war on terrorism. It's like a war on terrorism. <laughs> it's a form of left masturbation. <laughs> now, you remember what I said. In the left, in the progressive, in the, in the, in the liberal discourse, it is all about what the, wo the world ought to be. We are dealing with a dream, and we have to sustain the dream. How we sustain the dream? 
especially when reality doesn't go our direction, we invent bullshit. So we sustain our kind of raison d'être. Sorry, yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, an Israeli nationalist, for example, someone that supports Israel, would that be, by definition, a racist, an Israeli nationalist? No, no, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very, very important question. And uh, if you allow me to, uh, to, uh, to answer already, and then we continue today. Every person who identifies politically as a Jew is a racist. Now, I just let me, let me clarify. There is no Jewish race. There is no Jewish race. But Jewish racism is live and kicking. For sure, Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Arab Jews, for sure. For sure, for sure. So there is no race, the Jews are not a race, but their politics is always racist to the core. Now, Israel is slightly interesting in that regard. Why? Because I was born in Israel. I didn't have to identify as a Jew. My identification was geographically oriented. Okay? One of the reasons that you find some of the most interesting critics of the Jewish nonsense are Israelis, like Israel Shachak, mm -hmm. like uh, Shlomo Zand, like Israel Shamir, like Gidon Levy. One of the reasons is because we didn't have to identify Jewishly. We identified with the ideas of early Zionism, and we were shocked to find out that if there was a promise to make us into civilized human beings, we, we achieved the complete opposite. And it's not necessarily racist. A lot of Israeli nationalists are ultra-racists. But you can be a person, for instance, like Uri Avneri, who is a Zionist, who is nationalist, and I don't think that he's a racist. Okay, now continue. So, so you can follow that by saying that a majority of Jewish or Israelis are white, so... Is it the case, by the way? What's that? I'm not, I'm not so sure that this is the case anymore. Well, let's say the European Jews that went to Israel yeah, yeah. were white for the most part, and I would say the for majority sure. of Jews in the diaspora around the world are white. So if a Jewish nationalist is racist and white, does that make them a white supremacist without the protection of the Constitution of America where we have the protection Great. of all the politics of division Great. that we have here. So when people start throwing white supremacists here in America, I don't think it's really accurate because we have those protections in this country. This is a, you are, you are uh, eating here a very good say it. Projection. How do you define projection? Look at what they're accusing everybody else of. <coughs> Okay? Okay? Everything the Jews, the political Jews, are accusing you of, or anyone else, is always, always, it's a rule, projection. They project their own symptom. They are people in the most liberal Jewish circuits. JVP. Supporting the Palestinians, they are identical to Israel. It's a Jews only club. If you are not a Jew, you won't be the secretary of JPP. You are not racially qualified. Sorry, we can chop your willy. It won't, uh, once again, it, it won't happen. By the way, we chop your willy because That's another story. it's another story, yeah? 
Yeah. The wheelie choppers. <laughs> and this is not a squadron from Vietnam. Yeah? The wheelie choppers. <laughs> you know, like helicopters from Vietnam. The wheelie choppers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but do you, do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh yes, I absolutely do, and I yeah. think that the projection comes across in many different ways. And the politics of division that you described with all your different slices, you know, I think uh, the Americans try to repudiate uh, the politics of division by voting for Trump. Because for sure, for sure, this is very very crucial for my. We have. The identitarians, the ASA, and we have the Americans who say, it doesn't matter, I'm gay. But, you know, I've been my age, I do it once a week. <laughs> but every day I wake up in America. No, I'm not gay, it was uh, just, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even American. <laughs> All right? Yeah? Hillary Clinton spoke about the diversity. The Americans are the people who accept diversity. You know? And there is something, maybe I'm wrong about it, in my band At a certain stage we had quite a few musicians and everyone was from a different place. So, in the first two, three days, Ovidio is from Romania and uh, Guillermo is from Argentina and uh, Asaf is from Israel and I'm from Palestine, <laughs> you know. But after a week, we just have Guillermo and Ovidio and Asaf and Yaron and, and it doesn't matter anymore. And the same happened in America in the production lines. When you have one in Detroit, there were a lot of uh, Syrian, Lebanese, I think, with Americans. You're from Detroit. Yeah. Detroit. It was a very big uh, kind of a Lebanese community, no? Big part? Lebanese. Uh, I don't know Lebanese, there are a lot of uh, Dearborn particulars, a yeah. lot of people from the Middle East. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people from Middle East, yeah. and they were in the production lines. And once you're in the production line and you eat together, this is the diversity. And you, if you want America to be a diverse place, let people work. Give them a reason to wake up in the morning. And this applies to Britain to France and so on. If we have work, we don't have time to eat. You, you don't give much attention to the idea that so occur right now in many circles that uh, the uh, exponential increasing of the information technologies, uh, you know, going over into robotics, and that the labor theory of value is being undercut. In fact, the labor input to production. Is being under I want to tell you something. I came prepared for this question. Oh, well. Because, because no, because we, we, we always end up talking about it. Well, there's more to talk huh? about. No, no, because it's a crucial issue. This is, this is, the, this is one of the reasons reason that we are, where we, we are where we are is because we don't need much labor. labor. Across the board. Strong government an authoritarian, you know, if he's blamed for being Trump, he's blamed for being authoritarian. Strong authoritarian government should be able to decide, you know what? Despite all those technological innovations, we will build this saxophone with our fingers. We will build this car, and we are not, we're not going to be subject to competition with China, because China or Japan, I, I actually uh, want to play in China, so maybe I should, <laughs> <laughs> you know. China or Japan cannot sell in this country unless, in the next 10 years, unless we are recovered 
financially, economically, and so on and so on. Yeah, but the idea, the only way to distribute effective demand, uh, that, 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 that is Piketty saying that. Uh, you know, Thomas Piketty. Uh, the problem is you've got a tremendous capability for doing all kinds of things in a materialistic way to improve the human condition. The problem is they don't have an effective way of getting effective buying power or demand into the hands of the masses of the world to clear the market. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about the masses of the world. Well, the whole idea, the whole idea of nationalism, of nationalism is that America should look after America. It's none of your business what happens in Africa at the moment when people are starving in Detroit, in New York, in Baltimore. You have you have, you, have, you have to look after your problem. If global capitalism is the problem, this is something that you have to take home. And I'll make it tricky so I, I'm not getting arrested. If global capitalism is the problem, social nationalism, I'm supposed to be national socialism, yeah? Social nationalism is the answer. What social, I'm not a socialist or communist, yeah? I'm, I, I passed, I'm not 17 years old. Yeah? <laughs> Nationalism is the acceptance that we are living together on the same soil, on the same land. We have to learn to love our land, to look after it, and to get something in return. Socialism, I mean equality. A sense of equality, acceptance that even if you are not the most gifted person on this planet, you still have a prospect of a future. You have a reason to wake up in the morning, to go to work, and to support your family or yourself. Uh, there's much to be said for that. You need buses have to have drivers. You know, you need to by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, we have now technology. We have now technology that will save us from having bus drivers. But it's our decision to say no. We may sell Google information in China. We will have bus drivers. We will have taxi drivers. We won't allow this technology. And by the way, and by the way, huh? Well, okay, I hope true. the French, the British, I hope they'll follow us and the French will be French again, the British will be British again. It's like flowers in a garden. A, a daisy is just as wonderful as an orchid. It's different, but in, in the garden you need all these different flowers, but they have to be themselves. And then I, think, I think that there is a growing awakening. There is a growing international, global awakening, especially in Western countries, that uh, this is where we have to go. You know, it's not Gila Datsmon. I'm just, we all see it. It's, we, we all see it. Uh, this uh, uh, divisionary or divisive, sorry, I was saying, divisive politics proved to be uh, completely bankrupt. So, 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 so we are going back to, national, to, 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 to a concept of nationalism and patriotism, and it's all fine. But that, that does That's not, on the contrary, that allows one to relate to people, yeah. For sure, more. for sure. No, as as you can see, Trump won this uh, election almost easily, I would say, but when we look now at the results, because this is, whether he means it or not, I don't know, because this is what he promised the people. He promised the people, you are allowed to be yourself. And by the way, look, Tom, I'll give you uh, in a second, you are next. Look at Trump. Look at his Twitter feed. Look at the way he communicates with the world through Twitter. Or when he goes on stage, he's a fucking jazz artist. Yeah, it's true. He's a stand-up comedian. Yeah. Comedian. He goes on stage, he doesn't have a plan. He spit it out. He's a person that reminded us what does it mean to engage in a simultaneous exchange? Yeah, right. Rather than thinking, 
Uh, I I would like I have some issues with the <laughs> rise of gender politics. I'm not no. He said it all. He said it all. By the way, by the way, and this is something that I want to tell you, Tom, because you mentioned that it's not half enough. It's way more than enough. I thought that if Trump wouldn't win. The next person that will come and unite Trump and Sanders voters yeah, there you would, take, would take. And it's very easy because they were identical. The Sanders voter who didn't vote for Trump, and I'm sure that some, some, uh, quite a few didn't, yeah, it is only because the style of this person, you know, some people, he's a quite unusual character. Anyway, what did you want to ask? And besides, Sanders brought into a lot of the identitarian stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, when you're going to target society and start picking off these identity groups, right? First of all, the, the main characteristic is that they're a minority group, okay? Uh, ergo, the white supremacists on the other side of the border. And the other thing is, is that of that minority group, there needs to be a substantial amount of, uh, of the feeling that you've been put upon and that you've been suffering. And that, you know, and that's wrong. We've got laws against people should not beat up someone because of their religion or their race. For sure. That's, that's absolutely correct. But, but to go beyond and, and make people feel like uh, this is all wrong and we're going to empower you now to defend yourselves by being an identified group and you're going to band with all these other groups. And now you form this hole that if you don't believe in this identitarian politics anymore, then you are a white supremacist. You must be. Because you're the people who are doing the oppression, number one. Number two... But let me just comment, comment on that. It is very clear that until one or two years ago, if you wouldn't subscribe to this bullshit, right. you, were racist. you were racist. And suddenly... Uh, one minute, one minute, one, and suddenly, completely out of the blue, we realized that the majority of the American people had enough of it long time ago. Mm. Well. Now, why? Again, because left is in itself a supremacist world mm. view. Yeah. Left is the ultimate form of supremacy. What is, we spoke about it before, before. What is progressive? Yeah. If you are progressive, you, may, you believe that other people are reactionary. This is chosenness. This is secular Judaism, which is a contradiction in terms. There is no such a thing. It is secular Jewishness. All right? So the left is embedded who is a supremacist, elitist view that made them completely blind to the English people, the British people, i.e. Brexit victory. Now, here, it took nine hours to Hillary Clinton to acknowledge what you and me knew before. How? She was living in a dream. Look at the polls in France. There is no left. Hollande qu quit because it, 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 there is nothing. It's gone. There is nothing. It's a leftover. <laughs> so, so then uh, that feeling of having been put upon, all right, is then heightened. Uh, and political correctness is the antidote to this, that we can't even think in ways that are offensive anymore. And who, who are the best capos <coughs> in the intellectual camp, but the people who feel they were put upon before. Those are the ones you give the club to, to make sure that no one else can have any kind of free thinking anymore. And this is, these are the enforcers. Who do you think are the capos? Uh, well, the mini capos. I'm saying any, all the people who are screaming in the street right now, who are out of reality... But they are not the capos. The for sure, for sure. We agree, we, agree, we, agree, we agree about that. We agree about that. But who are the capos? I mean the, the cop was in the camp. I'm not, I don't mean the cop was the tutti cop. Like, uh, no, 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 okay. So, I tell you all the cop was. Prison guard. 
That's right. I tell you what, the, the couples. Prisoners were given a club to mind the other prisoners. Yeah. This is this is in a in a, in a German concentration camp. Right, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. In America, the couple is each of you. They train you to police yourself. And this is very, 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 very clever. Clever. Oh. Clever. And how did they do it? I'll give you one example. That is incredibly, incredibly genu genius and sinister. All in the family? Mm. Archie Bunker? <laughs> You all remember or you don't remember? Oh, yeah? Lear. We'll talk about Norman Lear now. Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker was number one most entertaining TV character according to many polls. Over the long haul? In the 20th century. Wow. Yeah. That's it's quite impressive. Yeah, he was something else. All right? Yeah, some, some polls gave Archie Bunker. We all loved Archie Bunker. I was in Israel, I was a kid. We loved Archie Bunker. Who was the most, who was the most idiotic, moronic figure in the, in the, in the, all in the family? His wife? It's no. no, his wife was actually very clever. Yeah. Meathead. Yeah. Meathead. Ten years later, we are all meatheads. How did it happen? That we had the most entertaining figure, we all loved Archie Bunker, mm. and ended up meatheads. Gene Wilder in the producer. What did he do there? Norman Lear was Gene. a Jew, genius, with a political agenda. He was politically involved, he was a progressive Jew. In the late 60s, in the early 70s, when the CIA and the FBI we're kind of trying to infiltrate all into all these kind of anti-war communist cells to find the, the anarchist. He was sitting somewhere in New York, writing on his typewriter the next episode, delivering this to your house, to every house in America, making millions Two. on top of it or out of it. And you were laughing, drinking beer, eating popcorn with your kids, and by the end of the day, you become a meathead. <laughs> genius or not? This is genius. Now, how did he do it? How did he do it? Meathead was a moron, but he had future. Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker. wasn't going anywhere. He was screwed up. It was clear Archie Bunker belonged to the past. He was funny, but <coughs> the future <laughs> was meted. Futurist. This diversity, <laughs> this diversity, this image, it took me some time to understand it. Yeah. So I saved you the time, you know. I. Meathead, Edis showed us the path of our American lower classes how to become respected and part of the new future by just amending our behavior. He made Archie Bunker <coughs> into a white supremacist. This was Norman Lear. He's still alive, I think, by the way. My friend lives across the street from where he's dying. Yeah. He, he's, he's alive, no? Sag Harbor. His house is in Sag Harbor. Yeah. My friend lives right across yeah. the street. Yeah. 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 But this, this, is, this, is, this is one. The, the revolution, this revolution, was taking place. It was a totally soft revolution. All right? So it is very interesting, you know, you have to think about it. Archie Bunker, 
made each of us into a couple. I, you know, I think you're, you're right about Trump uh, appealing to the, to the past, you know, to Henry Ford days when people had work and everything. And uh, people are tired of all of this identitarian stuff. No, and I think that Trump is, I think he is sincere in wanting to bring that about. Now, whether he's able to do that or not, yeah, it's a whole other. we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, let's assume that he is able to bring that back, or, or that he's able to bring it back partially. How, how do you see these uh, Jewish Mamanitarians, um, meaning, meaning what are they going to do? They're not just going to sit back and say, oh, okay, well. You'll be surprised. What, what do you think? Like uh, yeah, they will join the party quicker than you think. It will be quicker than we... <laughs> they're already there. They're already there. The other day, there is a... There is a if you want kind of a, to have a, a laughter on a daily basis, actually twice a day, subscribe to the forward. It's called the Jewish Daily Forward. It's a Jewish progressive magazine. It's kind of a Jewish psychosis uh, on speed. <laughs> Yesterday, I saw a headline. It's the headlines. It's like it's like you think that the show is just behind the corner all the time. Hoi, hoi, hoi! The the the, the Trump, Trump uh, dump is Jewish loyalists. Just a wow! No, I can't believe it. Really, you know? So, wow! So I I opened the and it's kind of three paragraphs. Don't know. It's Cohen. I don't remember. Moshe Cohen, who was a, a lawyer for Trump for so many years, is still waiting for a call, and they don't call him. <laughs> they really expect already every Jew, every you know, a, you know, a, met Trump ever in, in the restroom to get a, to get a gig. They are going to be very quick <coughs> to integrate into his uh, regime. The only question is whether he has enough people there who can encounter. And we are really in the dark. I don't know. I don't know. There is one thing Noam Chomsky said the other day. And I hardly uh, learned from this guy, but I had to agree. He said that the other day in Al Jazeera, um, there was a comparison between uh, Trump and um, Hitler. And he said, no way, Trump is not Hitler. Hitler had an ideology. It was very clear what he wanted, what he tried to achieve. There was a... a a set of uh, ideas that allow us to see whether he, he fulfill his, uh, he managed to fulfill his agenda or uh, comply with his promise. Uh, with Trump, you don't know. You don't know. Well, you, will, you will be surprised if there is no wall. Or maybe this will, wall will be just the, the highest wall ever and, it's, you know, and all America will go to work in the hall and then you go to work. It's, it's com we are going complete, completely in the dark. We are completely in the dark about everything, but, but, but I don't have any doubt the Jewish Mammonites will be integrated and they're already in. Okay, they'll be integrated into the government. What are they going to do in the country? Meaning, it's like, uh, that's... The Jews are not... The Jews... What are they going to do when this begins to dissolve? The, the this thing, this thing mm -hmm. is going to... The, this thing, this thing... Okay. <coughs> the Jews will integrate. This thing is going to die. Hopefully. This thing is... is where it, the Jews will join and will have to dismantle this. Because this is, this, is, this, is, this is clear to me. So what will they be then after that? A 2% of the country? <laughs> they are always 2% of the country. They are 2% of the country and 80% the of the elite. <laughs> but that's my point. Meaning, what, how will they, meaning they're obviously going to try to counter the dissolution of their do. power. 
What is the question? They're obviously going to try to counter the dissolution of their power. But this this power, this power, this is not okay. This thing is not important for the Jews because it's part of their value system. Okay? Okay, it's a very important point. It's not it's just kind of a strategy exactly. that helped them to sustain a certain kind of power. So now this power is gone. They find another, find another the, trick. What will the strategy be then? This is, this, is, this, is, uh, this is very hard for me to say because it's not clear to us at all mm. what Trump is standing for. I think, unlike JVP, I'm happy to give him 100 days, one year, uh, it will be, it is very hard, it is very hard, it is something that we don't have, uh, it's something with no precedent uh, in your history, the men never been in office, we are completely clueless. Paul well, Craig Roberts who is very much of an insider, too, yeah. and he's, you know, very uh, supportive, but he says, you ha he knows from, from being the right hand man of Reagan, how you need all of your, all these assistants, they're all in place, they're not going to give up what they have. In other words, the power of the deep state is so great that, and also all these attacks against Trump, I think he's right in saying this is going to drive him, and the neocons will come to him and say, look, everybody know, everybody hates you, but we love you, you know, it's because of the immense power of the deep state. And people don't seem to realize that Americans don't realize it. What I know, the only thing that I know about Trump is that he has really incredible survival yes. instincts and this means that he, for me at least he is uniquely intelligent but in a very uh, unconventional way mm -hmm. so for instance like a jander yeah yeah it's like the, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's almost bestial, actually. You know, he really, uh, uh, really something. No one in the realm, not of politics, of the arts, of rock and roll, would survive a fraction of the nonsense that he had to deal with. The women and the stuff, and not, and the all women, all white women, kind of a majority voted for him. You know. So there is something interesting. Now there is something that uh, kind of I, I thought about and I never wrote about it. You remember the debates? I, 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 uh, you remember the debates? Um, we, have, we had three debates. Have you noticed that in the debates, I now go back to the identity term, uh, just you know, in the debates, do you remember the patronizing, arrogant uh, facial impression that Hillary Clinton occasionally kind of uh, uh, put into place when she kind of uh, encountered the uh, Trump criticism? Have you noticed it? Uh, yeah. He would talk to her and shout at her, and she had kind of a uh, a funny smile. You, you do remember it? I should have. I tried to kind of look at it and to take snapshots. You know, what do you think? What was it? I understand. Yeah. It was a false belief that the, this identitarianism was much deeply ingrained in the society, and he was killing himself every time he went up against it. Yeah, my reading is very similar. My reading is very similar. And I believe, I believe, I cannot prove it, I, uh, the only person who, who, could, who would tell me is Sidney Blumenthal and I don't talk to Max. <laughs> um, I believe that she was told that this was part of the identitarian strategy. She was advised, they told him, when he speaks with you, look down at him. Now, I think that this cost her the election. And why? Because not a single man, 
I mean real men, accept women looking at a man, not yourself, at another man like that. We don't accept it, we don't like it. Even if, I, if you, do, you don't like Trump, this is condescending. What Hillary Clinton herself didn't understand, and Anthony Weiner and his wife couldn't help her to understand it, because he is kind of dealing more with kind of little girls, and <laughs> she's a bit of an outsider. The two men also don't like to see women looking down at men. It was that, I believe, that brought white women back. At the end of the day, most of us are heterosexual. I've been once with a woman, it was great. It was so great that I don't want to, to, to try it once again, not to ruin the, the experience. Most of us are heterosexual. We are tuned to heterosexual men and women interaction. At the attempt to interfere with our biology, with our biology, is a mad, sickening project. How they could even believe that they can, that they can engage in such strategy or even win on the long run. I tell you something, I don't live in this country. I know that you have all these uh, issues with the uh, transsexual. In my entire fucking life, I met, One. I think three or four. How, uh, how, can it come, how can it become a political issue in America? Yeah? It's what, you know, you gotta go shopping for minority groups to include in this. <laughs> exactly. You get, you get down to the bottom of the barrel and you get these very small groups. Exactly. Very, very small. And in my opinion, in my opinion, the straw that broke the camel's back yeah. was when you got to this point of elevating such a small you, you, it, exactly. And people say, you know what? I've been without a job. I've lost my house. I've lost. But you're coming to my town now, and you're telling me that I got to put three or four bathrooms in the McDonald's, and yeah. I got to put three or four bathrooms in my kids' school and in my church. Enough. We're done. And now exactly. 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 Now this is this is this is exactly the issue. So. The desperate, and I learned that it's now not LGBT and not LGBTQ, it's LGBTQ. IA. What is the I for? Um, intersex. And what's and transgender? Transgender. That's what I say, that's old. <laughs> old. <laughs> now, now it's IA, so in, in. Intersex and asexual. And asexual. What the hell is that? <laughs> asexual means. <laughs> Fancy a shot? No. Like women, you're just not as bad. <laughs> you know? All right, all right. How far and and how is it? Why why the Jews are discriminated? Once again, why it should be LGBTQIAJ? You know. All right. That's it. That's it. It's it's it. This is it's gone already. It's it's on the floor. You know. It's it's the identity politics. Is dead. Um, it's it's definitely it's definitely gone. Uh, if they are clever enough, they will mobilize. Anita, this is what touches. They will mobilize these politrucks, commissars, the black commissar, the gay commissar, the Jew commissar, the the feminist commissar, the, the all these Andrea Dworkins. They will come, they, they will, they will, uh, if they're quick enough, they will uh, l recreate a, a new form of politics. But you have to understand 
that this identity politics, it is not something that was developed in a one day or one week, uh, and it wasn't a conspiratorial. This is something that you have to, uh, to, you have to understand. It wasn't a conspiratorial method. It became sinister. But they came up with the, with the identity politics initially because they thought that, you know, women will have the feminist and lesbian, you know, they have the right and people, it's part of the... It's something that started with the Enlightenment, with, the, with individualism, you know. So it's something that evolved naturally and reached to a, po a point that is uh, ridiculously silly. And it, it, is, it has been defeated. Sorry. Uh, back to biology. Uh, yeah. Some of the people who are, and everyone thinks this is a big unit, I feel. Some of the people who are most outspoken about transgender are radical feminists and radical lesbian feminists who just happen to really want to be with a woman. I mean, you know, absolutely. Even uh, Jermaine Greer, uh, the Women's Festival from Michigan is dead now after 50 years since Woodstock because they don't want to let in transgender. Uh, yeah. They don't want men to come into it, you know. But that's not what I was going to say. You, you mentioned before. What, what yeah, this is very interesting, by the way. It's really funny. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think it's a transpartisan thing where people are it's circling all the way back around now. People <coughs> are but uh, something you haven't talked about, or if you did, I missed it. Then this split and this divide, I believe, is also happening among the elite themselves. Okay, this is happening at the top as well. And uh, I don't see you talking too much. All right, all right. This is a very, very crucial point. This is a very crucial point. Back from the dead. Very, very crucial point. What was the left elementary core mantra? Class division. A division between the lower classes and the elite, bourgeoisies and so on and so on. The genius thing about identity politics that once you are gay, you can be rich, you can be poor. When you're lesbian separatist, once you're Jew, all the Jews are together. Oh, it's Soros indeed, and then they, they, you know forward will write about Soros as if it's uh, their best friend. Identity politics obliterated not really delusionally obliterated class division now what was the left the left in initially job what was the left job initially sorry to deal with class division yeah. to attack to attack to yeah. attack yeah, to, to attack, to attack the elite, the capital. Once they went there, everybody was here together, and the elite was celebrating this state of paralysis. Making a ton. Making a ton. And, and, and you know, we have race wars, gender wars. So this created an imaginary elimination of the class of class division because now we are not defined by our socio-economic class we are defined by um, the kind of sex we are engaged with no, or not, not worried about i'm living in my parents basement i'm going to run out to the next uh, black lives matter group as yeah. much as i can yeah now, what is the point of these lefty commie jews who insist that everybody should become atheists and embrace atheism, but they're not giving up their own Judaism. Mm -hmm. they, they still fully want to ID as Jews, but they condemn everybody else who practices some kind of religion. Uh, I, uh, is, ask me again, because I'm not so sure that I, I got the point. Mm -hmm. I'm after uh, three hours now. <laughs> say again, again, say, say it again. Uh, well, I see this especially, I do volunteer work at a uh, community radio yeah. station, and they have programs where these Jews Posts. And they advocate that everybody should be an atheist. Yeah. That you know you shouldn't be a Christian, you shouldn't be a Muslim. Everybody should yeah. be an atheist. Yeah. That that's 
the flavor of the day yeah. for them. But they are still totally IDing as Jews themselves. They, they, you know, Judaism is... Culture. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And one of the most fascinating things that we have with uh, Jewish revolutionaries, for instance, is that more than a few times in the 20th century, as secular communist revolutionary, they burned churches. But they never burned a single synagogue. <laughs> All right, this is a fact. It's a fact. Not that I think that they should burn <laughs> synagogues, yeah. but I think that if you are secular and you declare a war, you know, I would start with my own people. <laughs> you know, not that, again, not that I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't believe in burning or, you know, I don't believe in violence, uh, ex except with my kids. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but you are absolute, absolutely right. And this, uh, this discrepancy is very common, you know, so they talk about diversity. They, spoke, they, they, they speak to us about diversity and uh, multicultural, blah, blah, blah. And then you go to Israel and you see the complete, complete opposite. It's racist, it's anti-immigration, zero diversity. Uh, you, you know, and you, you, the same applies to, 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 J, to JVP. It's the same thing, you know. Everything that is bad in Israel is bad in JVP. And if JVP at least were, uh, JVP, Jewish, uh, Jewish Boys for Peace. Uh, and if Jew Jewish Boys for Peace at least were, were not as militant as Israel. Now with Trump we see that they declare war, a pre-traumatic -tra pre stress war, you know. Well, for example, they have a holiday Christmas program, right? But the whole program is ridiculing Christianity and Christmas. But they will never ever, for decades, they will never ridicule or denigrate Judaism. For sure, mm. for sure, for sure. Uh, 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 there is no. Okay, there is no. There is no. This is kind of a, a too short. Uh, it, it is very clear. You know, I should probably come to to New York and to talk just about Frankfurt School. Uh, uh, you know, Frankfurt School is the is the, it's actually for me it's uh, Wilhelm Reich mm. and the uh, Frankfurt School. Um, Kill me later. The. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it for two, three minutes because this yeah. is the origin, of, for me, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, syndrome. Um, Wilhelm Reich yeah. was a Jewish psychoanalyst communist. In '33, he was horrified by the idea that the German people didn't go with the Communist Party. They went with Hitler. He asked, how is it possible? Like Hillary has been asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> how is it possible? By the way, it's an identical mistake they made. <coughs> how is it possible? And the answer that he came with, they are obviously suppressed sexually. <laughs> All right? Because they are suppressed sexually, they have all those authoritarian inclinations. How do we deal with it? We start to give them sex when they are very young to kids. And this is how we grew up. We grew up in a society that indoctrinate sex education from age nothing. <coughs> this is Wilhelm Reich. Maybe you just managed to skip it. You know, but I mean the 60s. <coughs> this is how we grew up. And um... Orgone energy. Yeah, yeah, the, the organ is, was a bit later. And the accumulator. Yeah, yeah. The, the organ was, the American was kind of obsessed with the organ but, and stuff. But the whole idea of Wilhelm Reich is the father and mother of the sex revolution of 68. This was mainly set to interfere with Christian values, with family values. Well, the Jews... Well, the family, because if you hypersexualize uh, <coughs> children, become hypersexual adults incapable... For sure, uh, for sure, for sure. But this, is, this was an attack 
on the hegemony of the church and the family. And simultaneously, the Frankfurt School reached the same ideas. And one of the most influential people in the Frankfurt School who became kind of the priest of the sex revolution, or the 68th student revolution, was Marcuse. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Marcuse, Marcuse himself wasn't gay, he was kind of a womanizer as far as I, I understand. But he idealized gay relationship because he said this is not for reproduction, it's just for fun. So women, boys, Quite strange. What is more strange <coughs> is the fact that these morbid, decadent ideas took over your culture. What is it? What is it? How did you let it happen? The Germans kicked Reich out of the Communist Party in 33. Freud kicked out Reich from the Psychoanalyst Society in 34. But you Americans bought into it. Because, not because you are bad people, because you are good people. And you don't have collective survival instincts. But, by now, you start to develop collective instincts. Yeah, well, look what Hollywood has done. It's a total denigration. It, so many shows, all these reality shows are based on humiliating people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, the no. things that they tell people to do are acts of humiliation and denigration. Yeah. And, you know, people, children have no self-respect. I mean, how, how can you get, you know, 10-year-olds photographing their genitals and posting them to the internet? I, I mean, it, it is so, so beyond anything that would be imaginable. Listen, you have to, you have, you have to think uh, that, uh, you know, uh, people like Jeffrey Epstein, Alan Dershowitz, Anthony Weiner, you know, they, 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 they are the consumers of these kind of materials. Yeah, and, and <laughs> at the radio station, they have a whole bunch of pedophiles and they're totally accepting. Yeah. The, the management, they, they know there's pedophiles. By the way, this is another thing about, you know, we cannot talk about uh, pedophilia now, but <coughs> you see, we have this thing in, in England with uh, Jimmy Savile, I don't know if you heard about it, it's quite awful. And uh, then there is uh, Lord Janner, who was the head of the Jewish community, and uh, he was charged and was uh, the court case was about to start and then he died, he was very old. Uh, but um, I, this uh, all happened in the 60s. Here, what we have, uh, what you had with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And, and a lot of things happened there and they tried to, you know, and we talk about uh, Podesta, whether it is right or not. I don't know. I believe, I believe that all these <coughs> sickening things happened here because, not because some people are morbid, they are set, they're certainly morbid, but we also have a very problematic culture involved. So when it comes to Jimmy Savile, he did it in the corridors of the BBC. All right. He could only do it with Gary, Gary Glit with Jerry Glitter uh, in the BBC because they saw it as part of the rock and roll life. This is the '68 revolution. Jimmy Savile wasn't an aristocrat. He was a working class, working class British working class were dedicated to family values. You read Orwell, uh, you know uh, the road to vi to, to vegan. You know, they were dedicated and suddenly all you see now is like a, a working class uh, um, British female with eight kids from ten husbands 
or ten men, not ten husbands, you know. All those things happened because we destroyed the church. Who destroyed the church? The Frankfurt School. The, I don't want to say Frankfurt School, the cultural Marxist. The people who believe that we can change society by cultural manipulation rather than a practical revolution. I think they also had very powerful allies in the eugenicists as well who were also interested in this whole crap about bringing down the population to bucolic levels and stuff like that. <coughs> this uh, destroys family uh, creation and reproduction, and the more confused uh, adults you've got running around who can't form a family and reproduce, the better it is from the eugenicist point of view. So I think yeah. the eugenicists very powerful. They just met here in New York City a few years ago. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey now, they all decided, all these billionaires, the, the older billionaires got the new baby billionaires together, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett and Ted Turner and uh, our mayor and all these people, and they say, and Rockefeller was there, and, hey you baby billionaires, now that you're together with us, why don't we just agree on a charitable cause that we can all put our money toward and be effective, and they came out with um, uh, population control, population reduction. Yeah. I, I uh, don't know uh, enough about it, but what people should know is that the eugenicist project was at large a progressive project, all right? So it is a very interesting, I'm talking about the birth of, uh, you know, it was very, uh, very accepted within the progressive circuits, and by the way, I recently uh, came across, I don't know if I published it, I definitely wanted, I think that I wrote it, ah, I, it's only in my book, uh, uh, the, the um, Israel in the early 30s till the, till the 50s was extremely engaged in eugenics. But getting back to the church. I think that we have to leave. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that nobody ever seems to understand or think about is that Churches are not just about religion. For oh, sure. Community. Values. And, and, Family. And it's uh, especially true in rural communities. Farm life is extremely isolating. For sure. You know, because children don't have places. Now. And, and so to go to some one building once a week and see your neighbors and have your children For sure. interact with the other people's For children. Sure. And this is extremely important. For sure. I am totally, I'm totally with you. Now, I think that when they plan to destroy the church, they didn't uh, really think of destroying rural America, for instance. They thought that we are moving forward. But the question is, why it is all the time Jews who are engaged in this tikkun olam? You know? Do you have any, uh, any of your neighbors who try to change the universe? Why is it always Marx and Freud and uh, Bernays and... Uh, the what? Margaret Sanger? No. Yeah. She was not Jewish? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so.